If my deputies step out of line and they violate policies and protocols, they will be held accountable. But when they are right, I will also stand here and tell you that. Stand by your deputy. Broward Sheriff Gregory Tony is standing by his and he is with us for an exclusive interview. We will ask him about those rough arrests. We cannot accommodate in Florida um, just dumping the unlawful migrants um, into our state. Blindsided, state and local leaders scramble to oppose a South Florida migrant transport that turns out does not exist for now. Nobody's asked me to sign a non-disclosure. I'm disclosing, it's not up. Hacking our elections, Russia tried in 2016, and they got into two Florida counties, but nobody will say which ones, why not? We will take that to the round table. A lot to talk about today. Good morning. Great to be with you. As always, fair to say the honeymoon may be over for Broward's new sheriff. It has been a hectic tenure for Gregory Tony, put in place by the governor fewer than five months ago. And during that time, the sheriff has been put on the defensive by the aggressive actions of some BSO deputies in several high profile arrests. The one that drew the most attention, the most criticism was the violent takedown of 15 year old high school student Luca Roll and Tamarack, there was an immediate outcry of excessive force and yes, police brutality. The two deputies in the video are off the job and under investigation by the Broward State Attorney. Another deputy is under investigation for punching a man handcuffed to a hospital bed. More accusations of excessive force and the case of a jail inmate named Tammy Jackson, who gave birth alone in a jail cell while corrections officers who do work for the sheriff failed to heed her cries for help. An internal affairs investigation is underway into that. And just this week, the parents of 17-year-old Jordan Bennett said he was the victim of excessive force by a BSO school resource officer at Blanche Eli High. Sheriff Tony immediately pushed back on this one, saying the officer's body cam video and other evidence shows the deputy acted correctly and within the law. Broward Sheriff Gregory Tony, right here to talk about all that and more. It is so great of you to come in, sit down with us. We have a lot to talk about. Thank you for having me back, and we do. Yeah. Well, we do, and let's begin with what one attorney this week described as a pattern and practice of BSO deputies abusing black and brown boys. Does that stand up? No, it doesn't. You know, one of the things we've seen uh, is a byproduct of two incidents that had a lot of notori notoriety behind them. The DeLuca incident and of course one of my deputies being involved in striking an inmate who was in custody in the bed. Right. Those two incidents stand out and required us to do an internal affairs investigation, but it's not consistently across the board with our BSO deputies being involved in potential exceptions. These are anomalies, you These think? These are anomalies for sure. Yeah. If you look at the amount of encounters we have in the millions with our general public, we oftentimes go without using any form of force. Well, of course, and, and what is news is what's not supposed to happen. That's Correct. That's sort of the, uh, the definition, but let's start with the DeLuca role. Uh, sure. That is the young man in Tamarack, 15 years old, a high school student. Uh, maybe we have the video. Cell phone video is what brings this into the public eye, and watching this cell phone video, <coughs> we don't know what happened right before or right after, but certainly seeing a deputy bang a teenager's head against the asphalt is really disturbing. Uh, what can you say about this tactical use of force to those watching? Sure, well first, anytime I have an opportunity to witness any form of excessive force on the iPhones, just like any general civilian, we have that cringe factor too. And so when I see one of our deputies involved with taking a young man down to the ground and his head striking, it's alarming. Uh, but it requires us to go through an internal affairs investigations to make sure that was he in compliance with policy was there anything that was beyond, you know, the nature of what we've seen in a very short clip? So yeah. if I could just follow up on that. Sure. So what we, we actually do see a little bit of the before. And DeLuca Roll does not, he's standing there. He is not flailing. He's not appearing to be threatening. And, and because it's an internal affairs investigation, understandably, you really can't talk about much of the detail. Correct. But in a very general sense, when you see something like that, what is on that use of force matrix mm -hmm. that officers are trained to do that we don't know about that might have resulted in what we see? That's, that's a great question and I'm glad you brought that up. It gives me a chance to kind of paint a picture for the general public. When we talk about our use of force policies, there are different behavior patterns that a general civilian may indicate or do, whether it be blading their body or clenching their fist or taking certain posture 
that allows us to start looking at how our matrix of what can I do, what type of action is going to be appropriate. And oftentimes you don't get to see all those things because you're not in that first person point of view or the camera doesn't pick it up. Uh, you know, Sheriff, again, there are limitations on what you can say because there is an IA sure. investigation and Mike Sass's office, Broward State Attorney, is looking at this. But you know, one of your deputies, Christopher Krakovich, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, he said in a written report that this boy, uh, Roll, 15 years old, bladed his body and clenched his fist. The video does not show that. And so this is part of that internal affairs investigation. We not only look at the video footage, but we look at the consistency in what our deputies are writing. And so if there's any patterns of this doesn't line up in what's articulated in writing, what video shows, what body-worn yeah. camera, all that's going to yeah. provide me with an opportunity to make a good decision. And Sheriff, what about body cam video from Sergeant Lucera and Deputy Krakovich? Because what is on their cameras? I mean, all we see in that famous cell phone video you know, is what roughly 25 seconds sure. or so, and that's from another point of view. Cool. They've got video that preceded it, that followed it. When can we see that? Once we finalize the internal affairs investigation and I'm able to come forward and make an appropriate disciplinary action, then we'll put it out. One of the things the public don't recognize is we don't want to put the video out too fast so that it doesn't impact the investigation. There's a lot of uh, young men and women that were there that need to be interviewed and we don't mm -hmm. want to screw them from being able to provide a statement. What, one more question on that particular incident for the context of it. That was mm -hmm. in a, a parking lot of a fast food restaurant Correct. near a high school. A, apparently, and I've, I've read this, I don't know this firsthand, but dozens of times police have been called to fights between kids. And in this particular time, there was a, a tactical squad in, in what appeared to be, you know, when officers wear military uniforms and bring big weapons. The tactical team was called to what essentially was a fight among teens. It was, what was the context of that? We had intel that there was multiple fights and robberies that occurred out there. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, having responded to that uh, site location numerous times as an officer, hundreds of students show up out there all the time. And we put our teams out there to help mitigate any type of, you know, progression in violence or criminality. So it's not that there's a military style uniform out there. This is part of our street crimes unit. Uh, they were out there to yeah. prevent any type of added crime t from taking place. Yeah, Sheriff Tony, let's get into the other incident that sure. you mentioned, and we showed some video earlier, and that was on January 1st at a uh, hospital up in North Broward. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this young man, confrontational, agitated, and your deputy, Jorge Sobrino, and you know, this man is handcuffed to the bed and officer, there is Officer Sabrino wails on this guy, walks up, even though he knows the body cam video is rolling, and punches him in the head. Now, what did you think when you saw this? Look, like I said before, if you're seeing something that makes you cringe and appears to be inappropriate, I have the same response. And so that's why I didn't hesitate from hearing about this incident that took place uh, and issuing an internal affairs investigation to make sure we hold people accountable. Is he suspended at this point? He currently is, and uh, the internal affairs investigation is now over in the state attorney's office. Yeah. And we had yet another, I mean, it, it, it sounds like, I don't want you to feel like we're piling on, but these are incidents that did happen and that are in the public, and public has a lot of questions, but this, again, young man, a 17-year-old Jordan Bennett, high school student in his cafeteria, uh, there is, I pulled the police report, your deputy responded, um, a s uh, school resource officer responded to the cafeteria, and we're watching video again, cell phone video, of what appeared to be uh, the SRO slamming this teenager to the ground. You see his nearest temple is a gash. He, he in the police report is said to have been choking one of the school employees. And so I guess my question is, why wasn't he arrested? And if he wasn't arrested, what did go on to warrant such a takedown? You know, I can tell you from having seen the surveillance video from the school board, which clearly shows that this young man was extremely hostile and flaying his arms and attempted to take on one of the school officials. And my deputy did a great job considering he was five, six and 160 pounds and took this young man down. And this young man was a rather brawny young man too, Correct. isn't he? Correct, 6'1", 185 pound student athlete. And yeah. so he was outpowering these deputies and the school employee. Why wasn't he arrested for battery? According I will to tell you, I think the deputy exercised discretion, having spoke to the school board officials who said they didn't want to press charges and that they wanted to see this thing kind of move forward. Now, in my personal opinion behind it is, 
when we have forms of violence in school, this isn't some minor theft or trespassing, I would encourage our guys to make sure we hold these young men accountable because we open up kind of Pandora's box yeah. for well, violence. Okay, so if, if he wasn't arrested, then how is he being held accountable? Well, the deputy exercised his discretion, and this is part of a new regime, a new model for, look, the deputies that are under my command are operating under a previous uh, mindset and approach. Uh, but I don't want to see anything happen where we jeopardize school officials and allow them to be hurt, harmed, or killed. Yeah, yeah of course not. All right, hold your thoughts. We've got more sure. questions. Thank you for your candor. We'll be back with Sheriff Gregory Tony in just a minute. We are back with a fairly wide-ranging discussion with Broward Sheriff Gregory Tony. Sheriff, I just want to sort of continue from the last segment talking about school accountability and this young man, Jordan Bennett, who, uh, according to you, is a bit violent with a school employee, yet there was discretion made. He was not arrested. He, frankly, was not held accountable for those actions. You are the sheriff of Broward County because of what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. That That is not mm -hmm. an understatement or an overstatement. And... And because the MSD Public Safety Commission found that there were serious lack of accountability for disciplinary actions in schools. So how do you now go forward with this kind of behavior as uh, even benign violence, if there is such a thing, and not hold kids accountable or put them in some sort of track where they're not going to be lost in the system and resurface somewhere later in a much more violent way. I think for quite some time, the school board as well as the sheriff's office have been trying to partner up and figure out what type of diversionary programs are gonna be successful. And what I've seen since I've taken office is that that process or that relationship has reduced some level of accountability and discretionary practices for my deputies, meaning we're so focused more so on who we're not gonna arrest that sometimes we overlook the violent crimes. Mm -hmm. And those mm -hmm. are things that I'm changing is from a cultural side. If we have a young man who makes a mistake and is trespassing or some type of 
minor miscellaneous offense. We don't want to open up the pipeline and start arresting people for things of that nature. But violence has to be unacceptable. Yeah. Sure. Uh, let's move on to, I, I think, maybe the most appalling incident involving any of your employees. We're talking about corrections officers uh, at a jail facility in Broward. All of the, you know, 5,000 people work for you. Uh, yes, sir. Almost a billion dollar budget. It's a huge operation. Fire Rescue works for you as well. Anyway, Tammy Jackson, 35-year-old Broward woman with a history of some mental issues, uh, was giving birth uh, in an isolation cell at this jail, called out for help at 3.17 in the morning, and no doctor arrived, nobody called 911. She gave birth by herself in this jail cell. I mean, this is just an appalling situation. I can tell you so far, I agree. I agree that it's appalling and what's been on the surface, yeah. but in terms of what BSO, our sheriffs and deputies inside the site location, what I'm looking at now has been, were we doing our job correctly? And so it's an internal affairs investigation, but there's two sides of it. We also have contract out to one of our vendors who provide the medical services, and right. I'm holding them accountable. Yeah, they and were called, they were called early, and, and it took not. them seven hours to get there. And they failed to perform and, and meet the standards that we have for them. Uh, I know that their president of the organization has already terminated some people, uh, but that may not be enough. You know, we need to examine yeah. what that relationship looked like on their side from policies and practices. Right. I, we understand. I think the question is, at some point, why didn't your corrections officers on duty just pick up the phone and say, call 911 and say, send an ambulance over here. We've got a woman giving birth. From everything I've been able to see so far, our deputies went through the standard checks and balances for notifying the medical personnel. And well, I the think people under con excuse me, under the people contract. under contract. Sure, but what I would say is this: what I would like to see them do is, our contract and um, vendors are not doing their job. Is to take on the responsibility of just making the right call, mm -hmm. and then I can deal with the vendors on the second side of it. Sheriff Tammy Jackson was arrested on March 27th. That was two weeks before this incident. Fully full-term pregnancy on March 27th. I is it standard operating procedure to put a full-term pregnant inmate in, in a solitary cell? From my understanding, uh, we normally have all the different pregnant uh, females or so in one area as a group, uh, but Tammy had become somewhat agitated and hostile and creating conflict internally, yeah. so they had to isolate her. Yeah. Hmm. Um, if we can, I want to move on in the time remaining. Sure. I want you to explain there is a tremendous new training facility. Training, of course, came to the forefront after the Stoneman Douglas massacre uh, for lack of training for uh, active shooter. But there's training for all kinds of scenarios, and sure. you're building a fantastic new facility. Tell us about this facility for training. Well, the facility is going to supplement all the different training initiatives uh, since I've taken place. We added in more active shooter instructors. We now have an entire cadre of nationally certified uh, personnel that can teach these protocols for not just Broward but throughout the county. That was your business right before you took this job, was it not? It was part of some of the training I was doing across the country, correct. Right. And so now we have a training center that's going to allow us to keep up with all the different practices and have a modern center because we haven't had one since over 100 right. plus years. Yeah. All right. In the in the minute remaining, I do want to just congratulate you on Monday of this week. <laughs> You and uh, one of your associates, was you were driving down to a meeting uh, with a county commissioner about your budget, your department budget, and you saw this kid legging it out of a 7-Eleven on Broward Boulevard. Just briefly, tell us about this incident. Well, you know, we had a chance to talk already, but yeah. at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a law enforcement officer, and so if I'm going to have a standard that my deputies perform and do their job, it's probably important for me to lead from the front. And so I saw a young man running out of store, and... I haven't been a detective in a long time, but it was kind of a clue. I was able to chase him down and apprehend him and, and end it on a good note, where there's a, a little bit of mentoring provided to the young man, yeah. uh, and I think he finally gets the point. How'd yeah. you do? Did you do a good job? I caught him, <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> right. I still you, have some good wills, Glenn. And you cuffed him, and there was no physical harm, and he was taken over to the Correct. jack. Uh, not every arrest requires use of force. Yeah. Sheriff sure, Greg Tony, great to great have to, you come in. Thanks for Excellent. your Thank candor you for and for your here. presence. Up next, we have a lot to talk about with the Roundtable. Stay tuned.
It has been another rock and roll week for news in South Florida. So many unfolding events, and now we want to try to make some sense out of them with our roundtable. Or at least try. As always, we've got a very good one for you, so some introductions are in order first. Rosemary O'Hara is the editorial page editor of The Sun Sentinel. Bernadette Norris Weeks is an attorney in Fort Lauderdale with the law firm of Austin Paymes Norris Weeks and founder of the Women of Color Empowerment Institute. Ed Pozzuoli is the president of the Trip Scott Law Firm in Fort Lauderdale and is a powerful voice in the Republican Party, nationally and locally, and here at our roundtable. Welcome, everybody. Nice Welcome. to have you. Good, Good to be here. Thank you. Great to have you come in. All right, there was breaking news, and guess what? Local 10 News, I just found out about it from Ed Pozzuoli. <laughs> what, what is that? News well, I you. found out about it from the Sun Sentinel. Hey, I, hey, I don't want to distribute right. it. <laughs> but, the, but the news is the DHS is saying that uh, they are not going to send a thousand migrants a month to South Florida? Is that, is that the news? Which we all already reported, may I yeah. say, but go ahead. Right, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, that is the news. After a very chaotic week, Boy. a very chaotic handling of how are we going to deal with the people at the, at the border, um, the Trump administration uh, has backed away from what the border its border patrol agency said was a plan to send a thousand migrants a month to Broward and Palm Beach counties, which uh, followed the president having threatened to right. send migrants to Democratic sanctuary counties like Miami, unlike Broward and Palm Beach exactly. counties, two of the bluest counties in the state of Florida. So here came this announcement this week from Border Patrol that folks were coming without a plan. It's like they're going to land at the airport. There was no plan for where they were going to to go. Who well, was let, going? let me let me so, just go ahead. Yeah, well, hats yeah. off to um, uh, Bradshaw, the sheriff in uh, Palm Beach County, because he really rung the bell on this and and woke everybody up as to what could possibly happen. And I'll tell you, this would have been just another unfunded mandate um, for Broward, for Palm Beach County, in a very partisan, deeply partisan way. Well, here, let me. I, we spent a long time tracing, you know how they say follow the money? This had no money at the moment, but we followed the source. And here is what I believe is to be true. And in fact, during the commercial break, we spoke to the sheriff about this. Sheriffs received information about possible contingency, contingency plans. plans that they were making, whatever, so for... So let's call them what they are. They were contingency plans. Contingi well, let, can I to just finish what I... <laughs> contingency plans for an influx at the border. This was dispatched to sheriffs. Sheriff Tony told the mayor of Broward County, Mark Bogan, in a conversation about other things, about these contingency plans. So we first found out publicly from a press release that the mayor put out that didn't call them contingency plans, but specified the number of people on a plane, how often they would come, and that's what set off a very public sort of confusion and chaos. Yeah, hysteria, hysteria reigns supreme in Broward, shocking. Uh, on the other <laughs> hand, this is this is a similar to a child's game of telephone uh, where the information gets passed from one to the other and somehow changes. And so let's, uh, let's make sure that it's clear again. The announcement is that those were contingency plans and that no migrants are coming to South Florida, period, end of story. Now, well, I no, would no, say no, this. No, no, wait, wait, no, 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 not end of story. No, no, right, for now it is, because it's not a story. And, and I would well, say the following. It is a story, yeah. it, Well, it's, it's a story in this respect. I'll say it this way. It's a story that our governor stood up to the president. Many, when he was elected, said he wouldn't stand up to President Trump. And in this respect, he was able to impact this decision well, he was to the blind, blind, he, where it was. He, he was, was blindsided. Blind he was blindsided. But he did step up and say, hey, we can't do it because it's going to tax, it's going to tax local and state resources. And I think the, the administration heard it. And so to the degree that those were anything more than contingency plans, that changed. Well, that and was the, the, one of the things that, that really tipped us off to the confusion of it all is, is the fact that Governor DeSantis did not know, because if he didn't know, then mm -hmm. we thought that that can't be. But but what DHS is saying now, wrote that Rosemary, your paper first broke today, is that there are no plans to send migrants to Florida, which to me, frankly, makes no sense because there are migrant families, if they were looking for sponsors, mm -hmm. that are here. I mean, there may be no airlift planned, but to, to have a blanket statement that there's no, no migrants yeah. are going to be sent to Florida, it just doesn't make sense. Well, first, though, let's also acknowledge that Palm Beach Sheriff Rick Bradshaw also 
was under the impression from conversations with Border Patrol yes. that the administrate that Border Patrol was getting ready to send a thousand migrants a month. Mm -hmm. So it was not just um, Mark Bogan, the mayor of, of Broward, who made it public. But you know, I mean, think about it: to send people from the southwest border to the southeast corner of of Florida, which doesn't, um, without any kind of preparation, just didn't make sense. The uh, part of the Customs and Border Patrol uh, Border Protection, excuse me, information had said that they are going to be in these contingency plans, looking for places where a there are sponsors or family members, and b places where there is an infrastructure to have a mass processing available, certainly. Yeah. Bernadette, yeah. South Florida well, is one of those places. Well, we know that um, Broward County in particular is a cost burden area in terms of affordable housing. And we also know that the business community recently really stepped up to try to um, put people in places for housing. You know, the big camp that was right next to the homeless camp that was right next to the Broward County Library, mm -hmm. um, right downtown that was moved uh, uh, with the help and support of the Community Council of Broward, in addition to so many other community business leaders that s stepped up. But that is not an infinite resource. And we really did not have, I don't think Broward's prepared. And Bro I mean, Broward County, uh, well, they were going nuts, yeah. as well as Palm Beach County, because right. where, are these, exactly people, the point, though, where are these people going? <laughs> Broward is, Broward's not prepared, nor is Dade, nor is Palm Beach, but frankly, what community is prepared to handle this? And, and so that's really the bigger well, national not in, question. Well, in they're Brownsville not and El Paso. Yeah. I mean, they're 45, not. I mean, I think on Friday, 4,500 people showed up at the border asking for asylum and 110,000 or so. One in could the last say month. it's a crisis. Well, well I, was it, I, I think it would well, be. And so when President say. Trump said it was a crisis several yeah, months but, ago, you know, every Democrat said, but, no, it's not a crisis. But is the answer to build a wall and to only pick those who, you know, will contribute to Additional our, resources are necessary as I, part of it as a I wall. Part of it's additional out, judges. Let well, me also is, point out that that, that facility in Homestead where we we op which we opened a year ago for children has not been a great example of how South Florida is prepared to right. um, I, I, embrace I, and, and, and find homes for Absolutely. three three thousand immigrants. immigrant children migrant unaccompanied minors are in that facility right now. Two hundred a day, there. more or less, have been coming yeah. in. Talking about airlift, but is it worth it to look back on South Florida just within the last few decades? huge migrant influx all at one time and, yeah. and how was it handled yeah. then? Mar Mariel, 1980, yeah. 125,000 mm -hmm. Cubans arrived, the great majority of them peaceful, looking for a better life, and about 10,000 of them or so were hardened criminals and mentally ill people. Uh, it was just a tear. I mean, I lived through it. I reported on it. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. it. And this should not just be seen as a South Florida, uh, Broward and Palm Beach issue. These folks would have been perfectly free to go anywhere um, that they could, their dollars could take them. And I'm sure. Well, they had no dollars. They, well, they had no dollars. Well, well, I mean, I, let me tell you, um, it, it is not um, un, unheard of for, uh, and I won't say which county, for um, counties, and I don't think Broward would do this, to, to send people, give them bus passes for other places. I don't, I just don't think that this county could have absorbed that. And um, there would have been other um, things in place in addition to um, looking for resources. Well, whatever DHS is saying now, I think it would be perfectly appropriate for each county to sort of start looking at contingency plans now before they are needed, and maybe yeah. they never will be, but you know, well, the problem is this this Trump administration puts out these horrible ideas, and if it, there's not a lot of pushback on them, yeah. then uh, they may become the law. Yeah. Well, <laughs> even though Ed says it was hysteria, if Mayor Bogan had not spoken out so sharply, along with the sheriffs and other mm -hmm. people, I mean, who knows what would have happened. So I think mm -hmm. the pushback from South Florida did maybe have an effect on policy. Anyway, we're going to take a break. Much more to talk about with the Roundtable. Stay with us.
Welcome back on this Sunday, a great roundtable with Rosemary O'Hara of the Sun Sentinel, Bernadette Norris Weeks, and the estimable Ed Pozzoli of the uh, Tripp Scott Law Firm in Fort Lauderdale. We are just told by our producer, Lisa Hendry, that uh, Governor DeSantis just sent out a tweet saying he had spoken to the president, and the president said he never approved a plan to send migrants to South Florida. So we'll see that and learn more about that later. Uh, Rosemary, let's talk a little bit about election hacking 2016. Um, our governor, when this was first announced in the Mueller report, said, we ought to know who these counties were. And he met with the FBI. Our members of Congress met, had a briefing with the FBI. But nobody, they're sworn to secrecy. Isn't this a public right to know this information? You know, it doesn't help the FBI's reputation to keep, to, to make it a state secret which counties were hacked. It's not like we're asking for the nuclear codes here. We're just trying to find out which counties, you know, had their voter data systems intruded upon and what exactly that meant. Yeah. Bernadette, I mean, you, you have um, past insider work with the Elections Department as the attorney mm -hmm. for Dr. Snipes, the former election supervisor in Broward. Uh, we, we do know with some surety that it is Broward, Dade, Palm Beach, Monroe. We're not the counties. Anymore. Right, we're not. And in fact, the governor last mm -hmm. week in his press conference sort of alluded to some smaller, less populated mm -hmm. counties. Um, Broward's new supervisor elections, Pete Antonacci, not us, not us, not us. What my impression was he was very certain everything was buttoned up tight, nothing could go wrong, nothing did go wrong, nothing mm -hmm. could go wrong. I'm interested to hear you talk about, with what we now know, how do we know the Russians can't get in somehow? How well, do we, well we don't know whether the Russians can get in. I think that the issue here is the issue we know is that the Russians didn't get into Broward County. Um, we can say with um, near certainty that um, the, there was no email open, and so this information was sent to all 67 counties via email that had to be open in order to corrupt. Um, A spear Broward, fishing Right, campaign. exactly. And so Broward County has um, protections in place um, for that type of email, and, and so Broward Cy County- Cyber security. Cyber security, and we also know that those counties have now been um, contacted. And, um, and Broward County was not one of those counties contacted. Uh, we also know that, um, or we believe that Washington County may be one of yeah. the counties. Um, that is, uh, there are two. Uh, Washington County uh, is likely to be one. That's up and in the panhandle. Up in the panhandle. Yeah. And it's believed that either Brevard or um, some other east. Sumter. Um, Volusia. Uh, Volusia. Maybe, maybe the yeah. other. So uh, we, you know, we don't have all of the information, but should the information be available now to the public? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the FBI is saying uh, uh, its reasoning is because the, uh, the state supervisor signed some type of a confidentiality agreement with the federal government, yeah. but it's one that the, the state supervisor well, was asked to sign. And then as, as a final thing, it's really crazy because in, in, the, in this state of Florida, the state supervisor of, of I mean, the um, Secretary of State's office overseas and is responsible for all of the state supervisors. And so, you know, if, if they, they make the decision, either. they and they didn't know. And the information is shared by counties. And so really, it's a corruption of the entire system, not just um, whatever specific county that is, because if somebody changes their address to another county or moves or whatever, those supervisors all have access yeah, to that same connected. database. And so really, it's everybody that yeah. was affected. So it's here, not just Broward. Here's my question. Or, I'm the, sorry, not just yeah. whatever the two Whoever. counties are. <laughs> the, um, the national security was the reason, even when the congressional delegation, Florida's 27 congressmen and women met with the FBI too, some of them were saying, well, the FBI says, we can't know because of national security. How, that doesn't compute when, when a credit card database is Not breached. Buying it. Yeah, mm -hmm. people who have that credit card are alerted, hey, this was breached yeah. and you may be a victim. How is that any different and how does it breach national security? We already know how, the spear phishing campaign, fake emails that someone clicked upon. What could possibly be a nationally security risk for knowing which counties had hacking. Beats me. I mean, I, I think it should you're be public. To, you're estimable. I mean, you I, should well, know these I mean, things. No, but, <laughs> but I actually think from a pr principled standpoint that it should be disclosed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, and I also think, I would say it this way, instead of us traping down this collusion uh, investigation, 
uh, the I've read the Mueller report, and the Mueller report doesn't go into huge detail, but it does talk about how the Russians uh, tried to infiltrate some of our data, uh, how they failed pr predominantly, but they did do some, and, and what their activities were. And the question is, how do we prevent that? That should exactly. be the mm -hmm. discussion yeah. amongst yeah. Republicans mm -hmm. and Democrats. Yes. How do we prevent that from occurring? Now, the, the good news is that, at least from what I, my reading of the Mueller report and my understanding of these reports, is that there was no vote total impacts or any of that stuff. But, how do we know? Yeah, but, how do we know? But transparency is the key here so that people have uh, yeah. uh, some confidence in the voting system. I right. think that's very important. That's why it should be disclosed. Well, I agree. That's yeah. fundamental. We all must have complete trust in the integrity of our voting system. and. This happened in 2016, probably happened in 2018, right. and now we've got this huge presidential congressional mm -hmm. election coming mm -hmm. up next year, and it's people not, just can't doubt. Right. It's and happened speaking, for 25 that, years. I mean, let's understand right. that. But speaking yeah. of that, what about uh, Bill Nelson, who, who <clears throat> said that and was basically vilified by Rick Scott because he said that, you know, perhaps we're hacked and, and, uh, and made reference to that. He, you know, he, and he probably had intelligence at the time that would have, yeah. um, you know, in, given him the, the, the understanding yeah. that something had gone awry. You know, the, uh, let's take a quick break because, Rosemary, you brought up something, I think, we really need to talk about it, intrusion is not hacking is not changing vote totals but the impacts could have been done in so many other ways that might have changed the vote so mm -hmm. quick break and we'll be right back Welcome back to the roundtable. Just to button up this conversation about this election hacking that we've been, ha everyone that we've heard from, from the governor to congressmen and women who know which counties were hacked, intruded upon, say nothing was done to change the outcome of the election. And instead of being comforted by that, my question is, Rosemary, maybe directly not, 
But what about indirectly? We know the Russians had a Facebook disinformation campaign. If they had voter information, they could target people with disinformation that made them maybe change their mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, how that to me just does not make sense. Well, that one of the headlines of the Mueller report was that the Russians interfered with the election. How exactly they did that has yet to be identified. All we know now is that there were intrusions made into voter data information. What does that mean exactly? And, and, and really, in hiding this information, really, the Russians are going to look at a program like this to see, you know, which counties did we successfully hack? But do they go into the voter rolls? Do they change what party somebody is? Do they, yeah. you know, say what, what their address <coughs> is? What, how did they, Public what did they do with this voter data information that they accessed? Yeah because they can create mayhem. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, and you're absolutely right. And let's hope that 2020 cybersecurity improves our in Florida and across the nation. Um, uh, Bernadette, let me ask you. You heard Sheriff Greg Tony. Uh, I thought Glenna and I asked some very direct questions mm -hmm. about really important cases, particularly involving the way some BSO deputies have handled the arrests and takedowns of young black men. Were you satisfied with his answers? Well, I think the sheriff is trying to find his way. I think that he is, in some respects, stuck between a rock and a hard place and trying to uh, ensure that the community's uh, answers are listened, I mean, the community is listened to while at the same time um, being cognizant of the fact that, you know, he has a really tough union that he's dealing with every day. So I think that um, in terms of um, Sheriff Tony, he is doing the best that he can to give the community the information that there has to be a process. And, and I think what he's trying and what he's going out and what I've heard him say in different group settings is that um, I am going through, I'm allowing the process for all of these things to work. And um, whether that process is going to be sufficient or not, we'll see. But, um, but, but you know, he, he has to, I think, be measured and he can't just, you know, jump with everybody, uh, jump the gun on things. I think he has to take things on a case-by-case -case basis. Some of the things that you brought up, um, these are things obviously that happen, but um, there's a process for all of it. And I think he's doing so far, you know, all that he, or a lot that he can do to try to make things a little bit One of more the transparent. Things I mean, I totally agree with you. One of the things that he is trying to do uh, is bring more training aspects to it. Mm -hmm. You touched on it toward the end of the interview. I think that some of the things we saw previously, you know, the, the debacle at the airport and some of the tragedy mm -hmm. at MSD, a lot of that is related back to the failure to train officers right. uh, and, and react in those circumstances. And I think his focus on training uh, both uh, deputies and others around him are is vital to making you know to making improvements, and that includes, by the way, that includes the use of force uh, when appropriate versus yeah. excess. You know, yeah. excess yeah. force. But Rosemary, I, I've got to say, I and I thought he was extremely candid. But when Glenna and I said, why didn't the corrections officers at that jail uh, call nine one one or say to the contracted medical company, get your butt in here, we've got a woman having a baby. Right. And they didn't. They right. didn't do that. For I, hours. His answer, yeah. you know, hours. for An hour, hours. Seven hours. Yeah, no, there needs to be, clearly we contract out for prison health care, and there's a process in order to control costs, but there needs to be an, a human reaction that this woman is in emergency right. and dial 911. Right. Um, you know, my assessment is, is BSO is a big organization of 5,400 employees. Uh, the sheriff has been tested by fire. He's had a number of incidents happen under in his short tenure. <clears throat> my, my wish for him would be that he better communicated. So in the first case, in the Raleigh case where the kid's head was pounded in mm -hmm. the ground, he responded right away and, and put those deputies on, on um, suspended them. But in the case of the hospital, handcuff beating, oh my goodness, you know, there was, it was a week that went by and Nothing. we were unable to get communication from right. him. And, and with the union and with the training, 
if you communicate, I mean, he's, he's an unknown person to us still, and you want to give him his room to find his way. It's a big organization and complex to get your, your arms around, but better communication would serve yeah. him well. I yeah. have to say, for someone who has not been on the job five months yet, he has been out there. And for him to come in and sit down on a live program and answer questions that he does not know are coming, yeah. um, I think you got to give him so much credit for that. Bernadette, he said something, the sheriff said something about changing the culture of mm -hmm. the department, which I think is, you know, just one word that means a massive, you know, mm -hmm. a, a depth, massive depth of meaning. Right. And I think a part of that culture is um, in a culture of inclusiveness. And so that's a part of the messaging that I've heard him talk about um, as he's out throughout the county um, and just making sure that he's met with everywhere from pastors, um, organizations to business groups. And so he's really out yeah. there trying to communicate. And I, and I know from the media standpoint, you know, you can never really give enough information. Well, and I know. I think the union <laughs> <Amen> <laughs> but, to that. But, he hasn't talked, he doesn't talk to the union. I yeah. think that's mm -hmm. not a good thing. And, and you did, and I'm very good at it, Terrell. Ed Bernadette. Rosemary, Good to see you. great to have great you Great to have in. you, and thank All you right. so thank much. You. <clears throat> Still to come, my personal perspective about the veto of the plan to overhaul the Coconut Grove Playhouse. Boy, that veto was wrong. A live look now for you from our tower cams across South Florida today. Hot and steamy out there, but here is weather authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with the official Sunday forecast. Brandon. Yeah, it didn't take long to heat up today. I think it was 9 o'clock and we are already into the 80s and it's been popping up a few showers coming in off the Atlantic. This one actually fizzled out near Cutler Bay all the way up towards Pinecrest. So not much in the way of rain going on right now. There are a lot of these are getting ready to pop in the Everglades and that's about where they're going to stay for the most part. There's an 88 degree high temperature we're going to see and I call it showers for some because not everyone's going to get this rain. I think it's going to be just a little bit too far inland. Some of us may not see a drop of rain at all and that's going to be the case each and every day this week. You know, we're into the rainy season and look at this 20% chance all the way into next weekend. Temperatures don't change that much either.
Brandon, thanks. All right, before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about the Coconut Grove Playhouse. It has been dark for a dozen years, and now looks like it will stay dark maybe forever. That would be a travesty, a shame, and a terrible loss for South Florida. A viable plan to rebuild the Playhouse was shut down this week by Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. He vetoed a plan to rebuild the Playhouse, retaining its historic fa facade, but tearing down the old auditorium, which is really not historic, and replacing it with a brand new state-of-the-art 300-seat theater. And that would have been run by our friend Joe Adler from Gable Stage, and it would have filled the seats and made money, or at the very least broken even. The Old Grove Playhouse was an artistic success success, but a big money loser. Mayor Suarez, who was a nice guy, vetoed a rehabilitation plan approved narrowly by Miami commissioners three to two. Uh, they voted on the plan, which took years to put together. It uses $23 million in hand from the state, FIU, and Miami-Dade County. The mayor, in his veto message, complained it had taken too long to get to this point and how the rehab plan did not respect, he said, the architectural and historic character of the old playhouse. I respectfully disagree. It is a solid plan with many moving parts, and yes, it has taken a long time, but this fragile consortium could well fall apart and the Playhouse may never open again. Miami-Dade Mayor Carlos Jimenez says it still can, but this is shaky ground. Now, if you live in Homestead or Tamarack or some other place than Coconut Grove, you may be wondering, what's the big deal about a theater in Coconut Grove? Well, this theater is a big deal. It is a regional treasure. I will never forget going there, say, to see Jose Ferrer in The Dresser. And you know what? Waiting for Godot made its world debut at the Coconut Grove Playhouse. It is part of our cultural identity. Mira Suarez, it seems to me, made a mistake and error in judgment, driven in some part by political considerations. Maybe, just maybe, four Miami commissioners can find a fourth vote to override his veto. If not, Miami-Dade and its partners are just going to have to find a way to go around the city if there is such a way. The Coconut Grove Playhouse has to be refurbished, reopened, and saved. It is too important to lose. That is my perspective for this week. Hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And get online. You can catch any of our programs on local10.com. And right there, you can also subscribe to our This Week in South Florida Roundtable podcast. And right now, stay tuned for SoFlo Health right here next.